David, happy to have you on the show. Casey, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I love talking about marketing, so I'm excited about this conversation. Uh, I know we we're talking before I hit record. A lot of construction companies don't have marketing uh, at all in some cases, so I, I, I'm excited to get into that portion. Before we get into all that, though, we talked to a lot of people in construction on this show. I'm curious to know what brought you to marketing because I haven't heard too many stories about what brought what brings people to marketing and why they're interested in it, and you know, ultimately brought you to this point today. Yeah, sure. Um, I started on Wall Street in a bond trading desk, hated bond trading and was terrible at it, but loved the information side. So I started working for companies like Dow Jones, Reuters um, in the financial information business originally as a salesperson. And then I realized that I loved marketing more than sales. And the difference in my mind, marketing is reaching many buyers at once. Sales is communicating with one buyer at a time. So I love the idea of marketing, became a professional marketing guy, um, rose to be vice president level at a couple of different uh, fairly large companies, publicly traded companies. And then in 2002, I was fired, sacked and decided then it was time to do my own thing. So I started writing and speaking. Um, I've done 13 books so far. Four of them are international bestsellers. My books are in 30 languages. I've sold um, something like a million copies of my books, and I've spoken at conferences and events all over the world um, for about 20 years, including the Builder Show at one point, and um, and have um, had a number of people that I've um, spoken with in the building world uh, who have used my ideas to develop their marketing. Yeah, that's quite uh, quite the journey. It sounds like you fit on and thirteen books. That's impressive because uh, you know I hear I've, I've never written a book, but there's I've heard a lot of stories about people who write books, and a lot of them, a lot of people say it's painful. It takes a long time. Uh, what has your journey been on that, and how has that helped you? Well, how has it helped me? I'll start with it's been transformational because when you have a book, especially a book that's po popular, and I've had um, several books on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list, uh, that's what drives speaking engagements. That's what drives um, coaching or consulting and whatever, whatever kind of work you do. It drives that to you. So it's classic marketing. You know, that that's what marketing is. It's figuring out ways to reach a whole bunch of people so that some number of those might want to do business with you. And a book, it, it, it's it's like magic because you get paid to do your marketing. In other words, I make royalties from my books. It's not a lot of money, but it certainly um, adds up if you sell a lot of books. So it's, it's a lot different than paying money for advertising. Um, yeah, at first it was a little bit painful, but um, I like to write. I had been blogging before that. I started blogging um, um, 19 years ago, I think. Uh, and so started blogging and, and used my blogging voice to, to write my books. And um, I've gotten so good at writing books now over 13 years that I actually coach people to write their first books. Um, I'm on the board of advisor, uh, board of directors of Forbes Books and um, have, um, as, as I mentioned, 13 books of my own, have coached about 25 people to do their first books. Some of them have become Wall Street Journal bestsellers. So I'm in, uh, it, it, I really love the idea of writing books. It's something that's fascinating to me as a form of marketing. Now, nowadays, like anybody can write a book, right? You can go and self-publish. Uh, so there's everybody. Well, even has even book, more right? than that, Casey, you can go to ChatGPT and tell it to write a book for you and it'll do an okay job. And then yeah. you can publish it on Amazon yourself. And there's people who've done that, you know, take an afternoon and all of a sudden they're an author. Um, but, you know, that's that's a little bit different than carving out a niche, uh, a little bit, di uh, quite a bit different than the idea of what is what is your take on the universe? How can you add something to what the world is seeing in a unique way, such that people want to hear what you have to say? And that's the key to writing a good book. Right. So there's still 
I guess if somebody, it's something that's been on my mind for a while. Like I have it kind of like in my vision, like I'm going to write a book, but it's you should. You should. And yeah, maybe I should, maybe this will be the catalyst to finally get me to do it. Right. And, and when, um, time. and uh, contact me, um, offline and we'll, we'll do a quick chat and I can give you some pointers. Yeah. I'd love to. So I'll definitely take you up on that. So I'm just thinking now is, is there a way that like you people launch, if somebody wants to do this, how should they go about it, right? If, if yeah. you're everyone um, to your, to your point, that's why I'm excited about this conversation. There's so much noise out there, right? Yeah. It's so easy to, like you said, write about, you put stuff in the chat GPT, everybody yeah. and their dog is putting content out there to some extent. Right. How do you stand out when you actually have something or you believe that you have something that's really good? How do you get that in front of people? So the way I, I'm, I'm a huge live music fan, especially the Grateful Dead. I've been to 91 Grateful Dead concerts and going to five in the next 30 days. Um, and so um, I think of a music metaphor as um, you can create your own original music or you can become a, a cover band and play someone else's music. E either one is a noble cause. There's nothing wrong with being a cover band. But the people who make a ton of money are the ones who become successful with their own music. The same thing's true of becoming an author. There, there is not, there, there's not really a lot of room to be successful if you say, I'm going to do another book about, say, internet marketing. Because there's thousands and thousands of books about internet marketing. Luckily, I was one of the first people to write about internet marketing. Um, way back almost 20 years ago, but um, but now there's 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 tons and tons and tons of books about internet marketing. So what I always suggest to people first step is what is a pattern in the universe that you alone see that when you say that pattern to somebody, oh, they get it. They understand what that means. And that becomes in a sense, the catalyst for an idea for a book that's unique, that is not a cover band, that's your own music. Let me give you an example of a couple of things in my world. So I'm best known for a book called The New Rules of Marketing and PR. And The New Rules of Marketing and PR originally came out in 2007. The pattern in the universe that I saw, which no one else was articulating, maybe other people saw it, I'm not saying they didn't, but no one was articulating it, is that marketing on the web is not about spending money on advertising. Marketing on the web is about creating and publishing content. That was a radical idea at the time. And I wrote a book about it and it exploded in popularity. I've sold 450,000 copies in English so far and it's in 29 other languages. Another pattern in the universe that I saw, my Grateful Dead, um, steal your face logo over my shoulder here. The Grateful Dead as a band were um, ahead of lots of other bands in the way they were doing their marketing. Aha, that's interesting. So together with my buddy Brian Halligan, who's the co-founder and chairman of HubSpot, and our buddy Bill Walton, the famous NBA Basketball Hall of Famer, who's a huge deadhead, we wrote a book called Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead. Again, a pattern in the universe that I saw that no one else saw, and, and my buddy Brian saw it too, we put together this book um, that became super popular, um, still selling well today. And um, a pattern in, in the universe I'm seeing right now, I'm not going to write the book, but a pattern in the universe I'm seeing right now, just to give you an idea, is everyone's talking about artificial intelligence, AI. And I've done a lot of research. I've invested in six or eight different AI companies. Um, I've, I've been speaking about AI. And a lot of people say, I don't understand how artificial intelligence works. My pattern in the universe that popped into my brain is that AI is really simple to understand. All you need to know, and this is, by the way, Casey, this is how you can become really, um, people can think you're really smart at a cocktail party discussion. <laughs> For AI, all you need to know is it's simply data and math, data and math. That's all AI is. So think about whose data is it? Whose math is it? Um, ChatGPT is really popular right now. It's public internet data uh, with ChatGPT uh, from a company called OpenAI's math, uh, data, math. So if you can boil an idea down to a pattern in the universe that you and nobody else sees, that is the the starting point for a good book. Then 
um, there's all the elements of figuring out, you know, what what your what your outline look like. How are you going to put stories into it? Um, how are you going to uh, create the content? Who's going to help you to 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 help put it into um, a coherent order? So a, a developmental editor. Um, how will you find a publisher? Many different ways to publish. You mentioned Amazon, but there's many different ways to publish. Then how will you get the book out there and market it such that people will find it? I just clicked. Did you speak at a Tony Robbins Business Mastery event? I've spoken okay. at Business Mastery now for nine years. I'm Tony's okay. go-to marketing speaker. So I just clicked. I was at an event and you spoke and I'm like, uh, why have I heard this story before? Or like you were talking about Grateful Dead. So I remember that. Yeah. And I was like, wait a second. It just clicked all of a sudden that, that you were with the speaker there. So. Oh, okay. So when, when, did you go to, when did you go to Business Mastery? Oh, I've done two of them. The last one I went to was probably five years ago now. Okay, so cool. It's been, a, it's been a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, great, great event. Great event. Yeah. And 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 here's the thing. Tony Robbins read one of my books. That's how he found me. I've been speaking at his events now for nine years. Right. Just all by all driven by the book. Yeah. I should pull out my. Uh, uh, well, I'm in Mexico right now, so I don't have my books with me. But when I go back to Ottawa, I should pull out the books and get all because I remember writing tons of notes during this during your oh. uh, when you spoke. That's okay, awesome. so th this this is uh, this is great. So uh, on the book side, so it is possible to self-publish then even a, a, a successful book, right? You don't have to go with a publishing company. Is that kind of um, school or is it still possible? Well, there, there's a number of different ways to do it. You can go to a traditional publisher where they acquire your book. Um, they pay you a small royalty. You can go to uh, a self-publishing or Amazon, which is a form of self-publishing where um uh, where you take on the risk and 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 so on and there's also a, hi a hybrid model that's out there but basically okay. the way to think about it is who's going to take the risk of doing the work to publish the book are you going to take the risk or is someone else going to take the risk and if you want someone else to take the risk a la traditional publishing uh, you've got to have a, a a really good book idea and a really good way to market it because otherwise you're not going to convince a publisher to take on that risk. Right. That makes sense. Okay. So another thing that you talk about is, uh, fan fanocracy. Is fanocracy. Yeah. Fanocracy. yeah fanocracy. Okay. I'll make sure I pronounce it. What do you mean by that? What is it? That What's is the that? idea of, uh, of fans are, are ruling the world. So in other words, how can you create fans of your business? And I wrote that book with my daughter, Reiko. That book became a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Um, it came out a couple of years ago. And we looked at the neuroscience around how and why people become fans of a product or a service or an idea or a builder um, or a tool company or whatever it might be. And um, a lot of that is rooted in neuroscience because especially the idea that all of us want to be part of a tribe of like-minded people. We want to be a part of people who are like us. So the organizations that are able to build fans are the ones that can um, do a really good job at creating a, um, a culture where fans rule, of creating an organization where people like to gather and become a tribe of like-minded people. And that can happen virtually, that can happen in person. Um, but the idea is that um, people want to gravitate towards um, a, a group or an idea or a company or a product or a service. And it could be, you know, a band like the Grateful Dead. It could be a surfboard manufacturer like Grain Surfboards, um, which I've got here, the wooden surfboards. Um, NASA, I'm a huge fan of the Apollo Lunar Program, which came from a government agency, believe it or not, NASA. Um, are just some examples of fandom that I that I'm part of that I've got behind me today. Right. Uh, are you a surfer? I am. I'm a surfer. I'm I'm not a very good surfer, but um, I've been doing it for more than probably 30 years and I love it. Amazing. I'm just starting to learn since we're in Mexico now. My son's learning. That's how we ended up where we're at. Oh, uh, good for you. Because of the we put our son into a surf onto a surf team and then I'm nice. Learning. Supposed to be nice. going surfing tonight, so we'll see. Hopefully, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's good. It, it's frustrating when you learn as adult because because you realize you're never going to be as good as someone who learns when they're a <laughs> child. But you can still have fun with it. 
Yeah. I kind of look at it as, as like golf, right? You kind of keep going back for that one wave. Like you keep going back to golf for that one. Oh, I, let me, uh, <laughs> tell me, tell me, tell me about it. That stoke is like, oh my gosh, I never had a wave and every wave is different. So, yeah. you, you know, you, you can't really say it's your best wave. It's every wave is different, but yeah, yeah it's a great, great feeling, great experience. Okay. So for construction companies, then, you know, what, Maybe, maybe share a little bit because you did a major renovation. You essentially built uh, another home onto your home. <laughs> yeah. The of it, right. And uh, those companies, I don't know, I don't think any of them really had much marketing. So I'm curious to know kind of what you learned through that process because it was fairly recent. You said about five years ago. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, from there, we'll see how other companies can implement this. So I started this process about um, nine years ago where my wife and I decided that we wanted to renovate our um, 1958 mid-century modern house. Um, and it's in a protected zone, so we, we couldn't do a whole lot um, from the outside, but we really wanted to do a renovation. And the more we thought about it, the more we, we thought we, maybe we should do an addition to. And as these things happen, as you probably know better than anybody else, things sort of one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. And we finally, and we, we found a great architect um, and a great builder. Um, the architect actually worked in the same building as me at the time. So I was able to get to know him. And it turns out he was the right guy for the project and he recommended the builder. So I didn't have to, to hire the two major people there. Um, and then we ended up actually doubling the size of the house and went through the process of living in the house. This is a spare bedroom I'm talking to you from now, living in the house during the construction where we lived in the old part of the house where they built the new part. Then when the new part was done, we moved over to the new part and lived here while they renovated the old part. And then they sort of broke down the wall and we had a, a newly completed house. It took about two years total and it was a lot of money and totally worth it now that it's done. <laughs> um, well, that's great to but, hear. Um, but what was interesting to me about it is we worked with a lot of different um, parts of the building industry. We, we wanted to have as hands-on an approach as we could. Um, that's one reason why we want to live here during construction. We want to visit with the professionals who are working on the house every single day and, and just make sure that everything was just the way we wanted and ask questions and understand what they were doing. And so like when we would go to shop for wood or when we would go to um, somewhere to look for bathroom fittings or when we went to visit six or eight different kitchen um, manufacturers, um, the, the marketing of those organizations really wasn't that great. And then many times when it was a, a sole practitioner, like for example, the painter or the um, the person who does the brickwork or um, the person who we bought the flooring from, for example, these sorts of smaller businesses, we would also often shout out on social media or a blog or something. I had a website for the house um, that I put together. Uh, I would almost never hear back fr from those organizations that I shouted out to. So it's almost as if they weren't paying attention to the fact that Hey, you know, I've got 125,000 followers on Twitter. I'm, um, you know, I'm getting the word out if I mention you, and 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 these people really weren't doing a good job at, at, at social media at communicating with me. Furthermore, most of their many didn't have websites, believe it or not. But when they did have websites, they were very very rudimentary. Um, and I think the, the the difference between the people in any industry, but this is particularly true in the building industry, that that really do a good job with their content are the ones that can um, showcase what they're doing through their website, through their content, through their social media. And my favorite example of that, um, you probably know Matt, um, is Matt Reisinger. Um, and uh, I, I met you telling Matt. this story. Sorry to get yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I met I, this story. I think this is the first business master. So this is probably like seven years ago. Yeah, I've known years. Matt now for I've known Matt for 10 years. 10 years ago, Matt Reisinger um, met me at a builder, a building conference where I was speaking about marketing and I talked specifically about YouTube. And I said, you know, for building for building industry, um, YouTube is a great way to get noticed. And I talked about that briefly during my speech. I met Matt after the conference, after my speech was over during the conference. He said, David, I love the idea of YouTube. I'm gonna start my YouTube channel this week. 
and I gave him a high five. Like, that's great. I hope you do a great job with it. I didn't hear from him for a couple of years, but then he reached out on Twitter actually. And he said, David, thank you for sharing your ideas on YouTube. Um, I've just crossed a million followers on my YouTube channel. And I, so I, I contacted him and I had an interview with him and I'm like, wow, what's going on? He goes, oh my, my gosh, it's going great. Um, he said that through YouTube, he grew, he's a, um, a custom home builder in Austin, Texas. He does high end custom homes, you know, starting in a million dollars. And, um, and he said that through YouTube, he grew his business from literally zero because he had no clients when he first started his business uh, to 20 million a year in annual revenue for his business. But then get this, he's making over a million dollars a year in sponsorship and advertising revenue on his YouTube channel. So as I mentioned with books, books are great because you get paid to do your marketing. In other words, you get book royalties and the books bring in business. With YouTube, if you do it well, not only does that bring in business, and in Matt's case, grew his business from zero to 20 million a year, but also the YouTube channel, if it does well, you can generate revenue from advertising. And that's what Matt does a million a year. And that million a year is just directly into his pocket because there's no expenses, unlike the building part of his business where he's got supplies and staff and all that. So um, Matt's my got a marketing crew, I guess. Matt's my post. No, no, he's got one person who does the videos. Um, they often will do with just one sh with one take. There's not a whole lot of editing involved. Um, it's not a huge production to do those 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 YouTube videos. So Matt's my poster child for how to do that right. And 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 you don't need to like do that much. You don't need to do. He does two videos a week now. You don't need to do that much. You you probably shouldn't aim to make a million dollars a year from you, your YouTube channel, although you certainly could. Um, but it's more about how do you get the word out so you can grow your business. And it could be video. It could be um, Instagram photos. It could be Facebook. It could be a blog. It, you know, we talked about books. There's all sorts of way to, ways to get things out there. But it really comes down to how you can create some great content. And like I said, when you asked me a simple question, I ended up riffing for 10 minutes. But um, <laughs> um, so many people in the building industry don't do that. You know, all of the people pretty much all the people who built the house that I'm talking to you from now, you know, I probably two dozen or three dozen different um, subcontractors, none of them really did their marketing very well. Right. So I remember that talk about Matt Reisner and I remember going back and we started a YouTube channel uh, and we've been doing it since our, we haven't grown to a million, nowhere close, but I have That's like, over, we have over 400 videos out there on YouTube now. Awesome. Congratulations. Content. That's great. Yeah, that, that's great. It's great that you're keeping it up, Casey. Yeah. So we've definitely stayed committed. So I don't know, like we're working on the content. We're trying to figure out how to make it better. Uh, but it's definitely, I feel like because there's so much noise, it could be what we're putting out. Not necessarily everybody picks it up. Right. So there's a few different factors, but I definitely feel like 10 years ago versus now, now people are kind of get trying to get through. So it becomes I don't know if that changes. Uh, it sounds like your advice is probably still the same, but maybe the the ability to reach people is or people is harder. So maybe you're just focused on a smaller group. We've actually gotten quite a bit of business through our YouTube channel. It's actually been right. fantastic, but we've put a lot of effort into it, a lot of money as well. Yeah. yeah. Right. So the question is, you're almost you get to a point where it's like, do you continue it? or not. And we've actually started to make some sponsorship money as well, which has been fantastic. So that's going to, that helps us continue it. And then, you know, you get the few really good comments every once in a while, like, all right, we're on the right path. We're going to keep going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you should definitely keep it up. Um, yeah. So um, the, here's the thing about creating content on the web. There's many, many different channels. We just talked about YouTube, but there's, there's Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram and TikTok and, and many, many, uh, uh, many, many other channels. So um, um, the first thing is to think about is what are the, what's the kind of content that you enjoy creating? Casey, obviously you and someone like Matt loves to create video content, um, but that's not right for everybody. Um, so, so think about what kind of content you want to create that you could see yourself keeping up for a number of years. In my case, I love to write. 
Uh, so I've been maintaining a blog now. I, I wrote a blog post today, um, 19 years worth of blog posts, which is a long time of blog posts. Um, and uh, the traditional channels that I just mentioned, social media channels, it is sometimes harder to break out if you want to do, a, let's say, a channel about building. You know, that's hard. It's hard to break through with something very um, general. But how about being specific? How about a channel that just targets a particular geographic area? Or how about a channel that just targets a certain type of building? You know, like I love that you're, you know, you, you, you just call yourself the conscious builder. I mean, that's, it's not, you're not just a builder, you are a conscious builder. And, and that's the idea of, of how you can figure out um, a niche within the broader spectrum that you can become known for. And, um, and whenever you think about a niche, when you think about um, creating something um, that's quite specific, um, then you're not talking about necessarily millions of followers. If you have a, th a, a thousand or 2000 followers, but they're the right followers that bring you business, that's great. And in fact, it's way better to have a thousand or 2000 incredibly passionate fans of what you do that want to do business with you, that want to pay you money, that want you to help them to solve problems. That's way better than a million followers um, who you never hear from. So don't get hung up on the numbers of followers, but rather than rather do become interested in how you're going to create content that's interesting to a group of people that you want to reach. Yeah, and, I, and I'm assuming that you'd want to think about the, depending on the content, so depending on the niche or industry that you're in, there's probably better platforms, right? So you mentioned like YouTube, I think is great for us for construction. Uh, you yep. mentioned Twitter. We haven't had any luck on Twitter, but I feel like Twitter is like the quick news, try to get your attention, bigger conversation, political <laughs> debate yeah. sort of stuff, right? So, but I could well, be I wrong. think I think um, I think because the building trades are so local, you know, unless you're selling products, but if you're actually doing some aspect of construction, it's very local. So think about the service, the social media that are focused on local. Facebook certainly comes to mind. Nextdoor is a social network that fo focuses on local. How can you um, create not not necessarily the you know a channel on YouTube that's trying to reach people in the whole world, but maybe um, creating um, something on Facebook where you're just targeting the local town or county or community that you live in. And if you become known as the best person on Facebook for the, um, the Western suburbs of Boston, for example, which is where I live, that's amazing. And that has the power to drive a ton of business. Um, so focusing local can be a great solution if you're, if you're looking to generate attention. And, 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 and you know, that's just a matter of of choosing the types of content that are important for locals. Does it make sense? So yeah, if somebody wanted to go beyond local for the content, uh, like us, like we're, we're developing, yeah. a lot of that is used for, for local. It's funny, actually, I just had a conversation last week with a potential client. He's like, I've been following you for a while. I didn't even realize you were in Ottawa. And like your office is like five minutes from his house. Nice. Sort of thing, right? So um does it make sense to use like the paid ads or anything like that if you're trying to build up? Um, build, you know, that's something like my team and I have been talking about, and we're gonna test out. Is like, all right, can it can it can we help us reach more people? So um, I um, always prefer to get something for free rather than pay for it, um, and um, and advertising is simply paying for attention. Whereas creating content is generating attention for free. So it's generally, I think, better to try to focus on how you can generate attention for free. But that being said, I do think that there are opportunities where you can use um, some advertising tools that are out there, perhaps advertising on social media, perhaps other forms of paid advertising. 
um, to generate attention. What I usually suggest to people who are just starting out by creating content online in some form, whether it's through social media or their own blog or their own website, or whatever it is, is to maybe spend a little bit of money on advertising in the beginning, but have a goal that over some period of time, two years, three years, six months, whatever your period of time is, that the, the inbound um, sales leads that come in for your business from the content you create for free will eventually pass the, um, the content that you're, um, or the, the advertising that you're paying for. Um, hopefully that will happen for you at some point. So, um, you know, in general, if you can get away from spending, I mean, I know people who spend thousands of dollars a month in advertising. Um, the way that I like to think of the difference is if you own your home, um, you know, as long as you pay your taxes and whatnot, you own that home. That is yours. However, if you rent your home, you have to continually every single month pay your rent. That's kind of the difference between advertising and um, owning your own content. If you own your own content, then you always have a steady stream of potential people who are visiting that content if it's good. If you're paying for advertising, you have to continue to pay for advertising. And as soon as you stop, everything turns off. Um, I'll say one more thing about content creation that's really important. And that is, again, the real estate metaphor, the importance of owning your content real estate. And what I mean by that is don't underestimate the power of a great website, a great website with photographs, perhaps if you have a blog and host it on your website, um, you know, having that content be somewhere that you own is really important because otherwise you're just at the mercy of the social networks. Now, you know, your, your YouTube uh, channel, Casey, is doing great. Matt Reisinger, as we just spoke about him, he's doing great. But ultimately, those YouTube channels are at the mercy of YouTube, which is owned by Google, their algorithms. And, you know, if they change their algorithm, all of a sudden, you know, you can see the number of, of people who are accessing your content um, uh, decrease or, you know, TikTok comes along and all of a sudden followers maybe go from their YouTube channels to TikTok channels. There's all sorts of things that you can't predict, but a website that you own you, you know, you own that and and you can't be at the mercy of an algorithm because you own that content. Now, now of course, you still have to worry about search engine um, marketing and getting people to see you. That's another discussion for another day. But but it is important, I believe, very important to have your own content on your own website that you control. So when you say that to so say so we're doing everything on YouTube, we're not posting videos to our page as well. We have our podcast yep. as well that goes to our page. Um, are you saying that you should be doing something else on top of that, like creating a blog? Like, is it important to have a blog as well, you think? Uh, I think I think as long as you're showcasing the videos and the podcasts, as I, as I think you're doing on your website, even though it's a link to YouTube or an embed from YouTube, you're fine. Um, as long okay. as like, well, as long as YouTube doesn't shut you down, which I can't right. imagine, but you never know. I mean, Elon Musk was shutting people down on Twitter randomly, you know, so all of a sudden, if you're making your money on Twitter and Elon Musk buys Twitter and decides he doesn't like you, bang, he turns you off. That's a problem. Um, right. So as long as YouTube doesn't turn you off, um, I think you'll be fine if you're embedding or hosting the videos that you put on YouTube on your site. I would I would make sure that you're saving those raw files though if you're not doing yeah we have all the files saved everything yeah. is backed up just but we just don't embed. In, just in case you need to put yeah. them somewhere I mean you know this is a long term play um, and as I mentioned now a couple different times I've been blogging for 19 years that's on my own website um, you know the, I'm really glad I've built up 19 years worth of content on my website it's um, super valuable for me now it brings in a lot of business for me now um, and it, it, you know if you're if you're building a, a YouTube channel you're building another piece of content just make sure that you think about the eventualities because 20 years is a really long time 
um, to think about if you're creating content for that long, that it's still going to be yours and valuable because you have to remember once you put content onto Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or someone else, that content is at the mercy of that, of that, of that provider. Twitter can do anything they want. Facebook can do anything they want. So um, a lot of people set up presences on Google Plus, uh, which premiered about 10 years ago. It was the social network that um, Google started to compete with Facebook. And companies spent a lot of effort and a lot of money and a lot of time to create content on Google Plus. And, it's, and, and two or three years ago, they just turned it off. They pulled the plug. They canceled it. So imagine if you had devoted your marketing to being on Google Plus and all of a sudden it's gone. Mm. So that's kind of what you need to be thinking. Of. I mean, I'm not trying to scare people, but that's what you need to be thinking about in the yeah, back of your head. I'll always be. Okay. Well, this has been great. I could keep going. I got lots of questions, but I got, uh, I got two more, two more all questions. Right. Uh, first, uh, I'll start with this. What, what are you most excited about for the future? There's a lot of things like new technology coming out. We talked a little bit about AI. I know you have a blog post. I was looking at your website about Apple's new virtual rail, or whatever. I forget what they call it. Um, uh, just what, what do you think is, what's got you excited, about whether it's in the industry or just a product even that you like? Yeah, I, I'm... I'm fascinated by artificial intelligence as it applies to content, especially text-based content. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated and, and have been studying it a lot and been doing investing in companies that are devoted to AI and advising AI companies and, and doing a lot of experimentation and how AI can use help me in my writing. And, um, and I think it's a really an incredible development. You know, if you've ever played around with ChatGPT and many of us have, you can see how powerful that is. Um, and so I'm excited about that. I'm also wary of it. Um, artificial intelligence, I think, has potential to be dangerous for society. In fact, I believe that the Facebook and YouTube um, algorithms are tuned for negativity. And I believe that those two algorithms are breeding polarization in my country, at least. Not sure about Canada, but here in the US, it's breeding red team against blue team. It's breeding, um, you know, people who believe in the um, effectiveness of vaccines with against people who don't. And that's unfortunate. And that's driven by the artificial intelligence algorithms that are driving those social networks. So on one hand, I'm excited about it, but I'm also wary about what AI can be delivering to the world. And so I'm, I'm looking at it with caution, but enjoying writing about it because it's really new and really interesting and really different. Um, so that that's super cool. Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot of really cool things in the next five to 10 years. I'm, yeah, I, I do too. I'm most worried though, about um, potential AI disruption of the United States 2024 election uh, season. You know, we've got a third of the members of the US Senate, all the members of the US House and the President of the United States up for re-election in um, November of 2024. And AI, I think is going to disrupt the election. I just hope that it doesn't disrupt yeah. our, our, our democracy as well. Yeah, I've been listening to some things that were like, hey, I can make fake videos, right? It Absolutely. Can Absolutely. Seconds of your voice, it can copy your voice, right? So there, there's Absolutely. all sorts of propaganda that could be made against other All people. sorts of things that could potentially happen, yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully it all uh, works out for the better, but uh, we'll see what happens. All right, last question. Uh, if there was, so if a company, whether they're new or not, say they just didn't have much of anything, maybe they have a basic website. I think most companies nowadays have websites at least not, a, but actually, you know what? I tried to find my HVAC contractor online the other day. He didn't have a website. Right. So, yeah, right. So exactly. What it's, are it's, the, it's, it's, it's dumbfounding. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think? I don't, I don't want to say top three things, but what do you think every, just for construction, what do you think every construction company should have at a minimum? And maybe what should they have if they want to up their game a little bit uh, and get more attention, right? Get more uh, projects. I, I think at a minimum, you need a website and you need a website um, that's just got the basics to begin with. Um, who are you? Where do you, what, what communities do you serve? What type of of, of products or services do you offer? How, do, how can people contact you? Maybe a few happy clients. Um, that's a minimum. Beyond that, what, what 
I always recommend to people is to figure out how you can create something interesting and valuable to share with people that shows that um, that you're somebody worthy of doing business with. And, and, and this is exactly what you're doing right now, Casey, right here. You're, you know, you're creating this series of of podcasts and video interviews because it's valuable for people. And then that has the effect of of having people become more interested in you and who you are and what you do. And so it doesn't really matter, as we talked about um, during the last 45 minutes or so, it doesn't really matter what you do, but creating something of interest on your website, perhaps on a social media channel, is what you should think of after you've got that basic website built. Well, Scott, this has been fantastic. Uh, sorry, <laughs> David. Uh, I like I said, I could keep going on this, but uh, but I'll, I'll end it at that point. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, or um, I don't, I know you mentioned like Twitter. <laughs> so people reached out to you before, but if there's a website. It's the best way. What's the best way for people to connect with you? Yeah, I'm David Scott.com is probably the best way. I'm the only person in the on the planet with the name David Meerman Scott, M E E R M A N Scott. Um, so my name, my first name is David, middle name Meerman, last name Scott. And there's a lot of David Scotts out there. And so when I first started my business more than 20 years ago, um, I did a uh, there, Google didn't exist. I did a Yahoo search for David Scott, and a whole bunch of David Scotts came up. There's a David Scott who walked on the moon. There's a David Scott who's an Ironman triathlon champion. There's a David Scott who's a member of Congress. Um, and so I realized that I would be competing if I used David Scott, which is my name. So I used my middle name professionally, and I'm the only David Meerman Scott on the planet. So actually, this is a I'm answering your question, but it's also a tip. Make sure that whatever business name you you use, whether it's your business name or or um, or the name of your company, whatever it is, make sure that you're unique, at least in your area, if not in the world. Um, otherwise, it'll be hard for people to reach you. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate appreciate you taking the time to talk about all this with me today. My pleasure, Casey. Thanks very much for having me on. Hey builders, I know it's not easy out there. It is a tough environment right now. and We need more conscious builders now than we ever did previously. So that's why for the month of August, we are giving a 75% discount on everything at the Conscious Builder Academy. For one low price, you'll get access to the entire academy and you'll be able to do things like master your sales and marketing for high performance homes and renovations. You'll be able to boost your profits. You'll be able to solve conflict like a pro and you'll be able to improve the management of your clients and your team and so much more. And on top of that, you'll get access to everything for life. This is no ordinary deal. We've never done this before and we will never do it again. This is only running until the end of August. So to take advantage of this extraordinary deal, head to theconsciousbuilder.com slash summer bundle or click the link in the video description below.